we thought, you know, okay, well, we have these five or six challenges with our businesses, with our business. It's worth a lot. Why don't we just sell it? And then those challenges will go away and they'll be replaced by money. We stand today. The Business Method the business with method. The Shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, where we examine the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. Our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There is a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses and we wanted to get behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build a business like this. We've had some incredible guests like Bobby Edwards, the founder of Squatty Potty, who built a $35 million per year company with just 17 employees, and JP Sears, the YouTube superstar whose videos are going viral all over the internet. I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and we hope you enjoy the show. The Business Method. We are so happy to have you here today, and I'm happy to give you a brief intro to a good friend and guest of the show, Dan Andrews. Dan is the co-founder of one of the largest location-independent communities called the Dynamite Circle. The Dynamite Circle, or DC as we call it, is a private group of location-independent entrepreneurs. The organization also hosts two key events each year called DC BKK and DC Austin, both amazing conferences I would recommend checking out. Dan is also the co-founder of a business that became the number one supplier for valet podium stands in the United States. We brought Dan onto the show to discuss life post the sale of his business, the podium stand business that is. He recently wrote a book called Before the Exit Thought Experiments for Entrepreneurs, where he takes the readers through a process of asking questions that are really important if you're going to exit or sell your business. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and he has a very interesting perspective on many reasons why he would have not sold his business knowing what he knows now. It's an incredible episode, you guys. Without further ado, Dan Andrews. Entrepreneur's systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Welcome back to the show, Dan Andrews. How are you? What's going on with you, man? Hey, thanks for coming back. And one of the, one of the, well, I have a few reasons why I wanted you to come back to the show. First off, we always have great chats and I know we've had calls where, you know, both of us have mentioned like, why aren't we recording this right now? We should, this should be a great podcast. And so I thought, well, let's just have another chat with Dan to see how it goes. Uh, For the listeners, we had Dan on the show over a year ago and we had a good show, but I wanted to bring him back. I I prefer the private calls. We don't need to monetize our friendship, you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Only occasionally. Yeah. And sometimes (laughs) the private calls bring out the best material because oh, yeah. I don't know, this is, do you know, this is the fifth podcast we've done together? Wow. No. Yeah. No, I don't think I've podcasted that many times with anybody else. We also had a few that never made it to the light of day. We yeah. have like the, the B sides. Yeah. Which might be released. Well, that, posthumous. that, yeah, that includes, I think at least one of them that okay. I was talking about, but so, so we ought to be good at this by now. We hope so. <laughs> Let the listeners decide. <laughs> but uh, uh, well, uh, uh, to interrupt, I will say that I th- and this episode may serve as an example of this. It's often harder to do a podcast with someone, you know, personally, because uh, for a variety of reasons, I think it's hard to interview people that, you know, it, it could. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. We'll I, see. Yeah. Let the, let the listeners be the judge. <laughs> I want to say, though, I appreciate all the great things that you have done for the podcasting world and the location independent entrepreneurial world. If you guys don't know, the listeners don't know, Dan does a lot of stuff for entrepreneurs that have that really helps him grow. So that's another reason why I wanted you to come back on the show. We could chat about your new book, some of the stuff that's happening, the uh, sell of your business, good decision, bad decision, weighing that back and forth, and the life as a location independent entrepreneur. So welcome back to the show. Thanks, Chris. It's, it's fantastic to be here. Where are you now? 
I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, seat of Amish country. Wow. Um, it's sort of an, it's a small town. I grew up in it. It's uh, located an hour uh, west of Philadelphia. Give us your best Amish story. Uh, I think that uh, people probably don't know who the Amish people are, generally speaking. Uh, so for listeners out there, there's a group of Germanic immigrants that moved to the United States in order to practice their religion freely. And that religion creates this really tight community bond. So the other day I'm riding my bike past an Amish church service and no exaggeration, there's over a hundred horse-drawn carriages in the parking lot along with 200 bicycles. This is a very bicycle friendly area of the country. (laughs) And, uh, you know, uh, there's no musical instruments in these church services, so you can hear the the singing coming through the walls. And uh, maybe what a couple of things people don't know about the Amish people is how entrepreneurial they are. Mm-hmm. Is that a lot of the major industries in our area, like sort of uh, like furniture building, for example, are uh, dominated and run by by Amish people who. Uh, do something that many in the technology world have failed to do, which is they consciously resist certain technologies Mm -hmm. that they feel decay their community. So the Amish were highlighted in Kevin Kelly's excellent book, What Technology Wants, because they're some of the few people that have encountered technology and proactively limited its influence on their life. So... This has been a big theme in my life. Uh, you know, when I was in college, I studied Heidegger, who has this great essay um, on technology. And it essentially is this sort of uh, really, really depressing idea about how technology is sort of invading us and changing the way we live and, and sort of screwing us up in a, in a way that I think all of us can relate to at least a little bit. Um, but it's, on the other hand, it's giving us so much freedom and power. So it's a double-edged sword. And uh, Kevin Kelly saw these Amish people, the people that I sort of took for granted growing up, as an example of how one might live in the midst of technology. So that's one of the things that's interesting about them. I think people that are, quote-unquote, off the gridders could learn a lot from, or might check out the Amish communities and the Amish and what they do, because they're 100% off the grid for the most part. Totally. You know? Totally. I had I do have this funny story that I have to share about Amish folks. Um, I was living in Osceola, Iowa, and working on a farm uh, of a friend a while back, years ago. A lot of Amish people are in Iowa. A lot of p- Amish people in the community. And <clears throat> there's I I pulled up in the truck to pick up a friend to go to work, and I honked the horn, and you know he didn't come out or whatever, and then I honked the horn again. And then an Amish guy, a young guy, he's probably in his early 20s, has his carriage and his horse, and he's coming towards me in his truck. And I looked at him, and I'm a friendly guy, and everybody in small towns wave to each other anyway. So I waved to him, and he kind of looked at me, and then I waved to him again, and he kind of looked, and he's like, is that guy waving, waving to me? And then I waved to him a third time. And at this third time I waved to him, he his carriage did a, a full-on curb check, and his horse and his carriage go up on the curb, and he freaks out for a second and jumps out <laughs> and has to get, the poor guy has to get his horse and his carriage back on the road. And then he actually waved once he got control of his carriage again. He's like, yeah, he must have been waving too. And uh, I gave him a smile and like, see you later, you know. So you caused an accident. Those things are expensive. An man. Amish accident, yeah. Yeah. You know what it costs to fix an Amish wheel on a carriage these days? Mm. It can't be cheap. I don't know, Yeah. <laughs> Well, all right, let's get into the show. <laughs> so why are we talking? What do you want to talk to me for? Ah, I want to do a podcast. I want to do a podcast for a couple of reasons. Well, I'm lining up a bunch of awesome people to do the rebrand of the podcast, one. Two, we always do good podcasts. And I know we do good calls, too, when sometimes we're thinking we should actually be recording our calls because they would make good podcasts. So that's another reason. And I thought, hey, you know, let's promote your book. And I I remember when we did the last podcast, too, that uh, we talked a lot about the D.C. and about you, but we didn't dive a lot into, you know, the building of your business that you guys sold. So 
doing being that we're doing this run of seven figure location independent entrepreneurs, I thought it would be proper to have you on the show again. That's great. Yeah. Is it hard to find seven figure location independent entrepreneurs? It is not. It is not. <laughs> Things have changed. Yes, things have changed. You know, and I thought it would be, and a lot of people thought it would be, but uh, they come out of the woodwork. And then you get a lot of people that are like, hey, I spent three weeks in Australia, my location independent. And so I kind of have to go, you know, figure out if they are actually location independent or, or what's going well, on. Well, that's an interesting question. How do you even define it now? You know, what I, I want to focus on are the type of people like, you and Nick Ginsburg that are truly living the location independent life, not spending 12 months out of the year in Southern California, having an internet business and take, you know, a couple of vacations for three weeks in Australia and three weeks in Europe throughout the year. Something that's mm -hmm. people that are really living that location independent lifestyle that are like, hey, you know, I was in Barcelona but I think I may just go chill in my hometown for six months and see how that is, that sort of thing, you know? <laughs> or right. or like Michael Peterson, who, you know, he's from Australia, and he was like, it was my wife's dream to spend a year in France. So we up, you know, we took the family out, made the business fully location independent, and we moved to France for a year and ended up staying 18 months because we loved it so much. That sort right. of thing, you know, that, that can give some good, good feedback about really really doing doing a thing i think what's so interesting about it is like that we're exploring like these new metaphors and sometimes using old ones like so i just said the word snowbird yeah you know, like that's like a <laughs> that's like a metaphor it's an actual metaphor for how like animals live yeah and uh and so like i think because we have all these new tools it's like well how are we gonna live now this is the question has gotten more interesting mm -hmm. it's very true um so yeah, one of the things I've Go ahead. one of the things I, the 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 project that I'm excited about right now is like this home project, like sort of figuring out like how much my hometown, or like that core definition of home, which might be like the that place which can't turn you away, mm -hmm. um, not like a place that I've made my own or whatever. Like home, there's different versions of what a home can be, mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm sort of exploring that project now. Um, that's what I'm excited about. Like, what does it mean to me? What, what's like, what's it worth? You know, yeah. like it's certainly not worth giving up mobility and freedom. Yeah. Um, which is like what inspired a lot of us to go on this run in the first place. But I think when you get to like that seven figure level, the question reemerges like, um, like, am I just going to keep migrating for the rest of my life? Right. Or is there going to be like some kind of beehive that all the sugar comes back and makes a honeycomb <laughs> kind of thing? Right. <laughs> so that's right. interesting stuff. Well, it's cool because, you know, it's it's interesting and it's tempting because you kind of thought Barcelona would be your beehive, right? And I did, I yeah. did too. But still seeing that things change and we still have this mobility where I'm like, you know, oh, let's check out. You know, let's spend six months in Italy or three months in Italy or whatever, and then try Budapest for a while. And you're like, hey, you know, taxes or exchange rate sucks right now. Taxes are expensive. Let me try America. Let me try Pennsylvania for a while and see what happens. But I'm curious to see your results because I think eventually I'm going to have to do something like you're doing just because I know my dad's, I'm an only child and my dad's health is decaying. And within the next decade or so, I think I'll, I'll want to go home and spend a significant amount of time there to help my parents go through that process of not only downsizing, but, you know, taking care, uh, helping mom take care of dad when his, you know, when that moment does come. It does because that's actually one of my core drivers uh -huh. is that, uh, like the Barcelona experiment has become clear to me. And like one of the things that I thought would be true in Spain is that I could basically live there full time as a digital nomad type of status. Mm -hmm. And it's become clear to me that the cost of that is higher than I had originally suspected. Mm -hmm. So the the example I, I might have given it to you on our last call is like if you're gonna like go to a Fulbright scholarship or whatever and like go to spend a, a, a year abroad in Europe, you're willing to like spend that month to like get all your background checks and like get all your advisors to write you notes and then to apply and then you go and it's really exciting. But like 
that month happens every year if you want to maintain that status unless you have like a really solid loophole because all the other loopholes would have taken me a ton of energy to open right so i think from a strategic perspective i feel like this is a stronger move but emotionally it was really motivated by um like this unsustainable situation where I can't like keep staying in my parents' bedroom when I come back here. I want to like stay here for months. Right. right. And I've like sort of earned that privilege with these business businesses. So, but I want a sustainable situation that I can actually be of aid in my local community without being the spare bedroom guy. Right. So that's kind of like my, I mean, I don't want to be like too hoity toity. Like I could definitely live in my parents' spare bedroom. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you don't want to. Yeah. And also I'm thinking like, like what you mentioned is really appealing to me. Like what's my 10 or 20 year plan here? Like I don't want to be ghost from my parents for the next 10 years. Uh, but I also don't want to be living in their house. Right. So what's the, what's the middle ground there? And for me, it's just being a snowbird. <laughs> That's the plan. I always think of people, old people from Florida when I think of snowbirds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like it's getting cold. I'm getting the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, very true. Like what you're hearing? Dan gave us so much valuable content that we had to split it up into two amazing podcasts. The next show will be published right after this one, so you won't have to wait too long. In that show, we dive deeper into the idea of exiting a business and the important things one should measure before making the exit. It's another incredible episode, so be sure to check that one out too. And now, back to the show i think the theme like in the community right now or one of the big ones is like people are feeling like emotionally bankrupted by the lifestyle yeah and uh and so um like there's um and talib's ideas are interesting for this too because he has that lindy principle which is essentially like how long something's been around is how likely it's to be around in the future so because in this lifestyle we're doing so many new things, um, a lot of it's not sustainable. Okay. So, or a lot of it won't sustain. Right. And there's like a reason why people do things the way they do. And like that's always more interesting than criticizing what they're doing. Um, and so like when you look at people who like stay in their hometown and stay with their families, do this kind of stuff, it's like, yeah, you can criticize it, but it's probably more interesting to take a look at like what the virtue in it is. Um, and I think in the community, we've tended to like throw the baby out with the bathwater a little bit, you know, like we're going to do all this new stuff and we're going to do it a completely different way and fuck jobs and fuck careers and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. We're right. You're wrong. Do it our way. Yeah. And then you end up like in an ashram in India somewhere five years <laughs> later. And you're like, why am I not happy? <laughs> yeah, exactly that. <laughs> yeah. And it, that goes to show like, just the, and I think that's a couple of things that you and I, you know, we're similar ages and that we've, we long for, we were looking for in Barcelona, a place to put roots down, you know, and still kind of looking for that, although we've not necessarily found that. And it's a process that just takes longer for people like us, I suppose. Oh, and also the process of putting down roots in such a place is, um, you know, it's worth doing a correct accounting of, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah and that's one of the things like for me i, I i'm not willing to pay the cost mm -hmm. um particularly when in the back of my mind i'm sure you can relate to this is like i'm one fun phone call away from this all disappearing yeah and that phone call is gonna come someday yeah and i'm the you're the only child i'm the oldest child and it's like I know exactly what's going to happen when that phone call comes. So why aren't I planning for it? Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so Spain ain't going nowhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we left the U.S., we had this thought, we could always go back to the U.S. or always go back home, yeah? And now we're like, we could always go back to Barcelona. It'll always be there. <laughs> it's not going okay. anywhere. Exactly. Yeah, and it may be a better place in the next few years, you know? Who knows with all the legal stuff that's going on and political stuff. Yeah. So, what what kind of new stuff are you up to these days, Dan? Yeah, the newest the newest thing for me is that I wrote a book, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been in sort of right now. I'm recording the audio book. Like that's something I'll be working on this afternoon. Just sort of launched it. Uh, have 
the first few thousands of readers coming through and the reviews coming in. And uh, it's been a very interesting process. So the book's called Before the Exit, Thought Experiments for Entrepreneurs. And I wrote it for people that are thinking about selling their business. But I hope and what I've heard is that the, the thought experiments in the book can be relevant for people that are just getting started. Um, you know, it's often said that, you know, you should build with the end in mind. And a lot of books like Build to Sell, like sort of talk about this. Um, but the reality is that exiting a business is a, is a topic that's very rarely talked about. And it's a lot more than simply getting a good price for your business. And it's a lot more than working yourself out of a business, which is, I think, what a lot of these uh, sort of how to build with the exit in mind books focus on. And that's all well and good. But that's not the actual emotional experience that you're going to have one day when you're going through a process of exiting. And so that's what I wanted to write a book about was this process that's life changing in every way that for some reason, which we could speculate about, isn't written about very much on the web. What was so that? That's, that's the book. What was that process like for you? Well, it was confusing. I, like in some ways, like the book has been many things, but it's been a cathartic experience of, of sort of just processing it and sort of being done with it. Just putting it in a book and saying like, here was why we were so confused. Here's why we made bad judgments. Here's all the things we wish we would have thought about. Here's why we were like depressed about it afterwards, mm. you know? And, and so it was so many things, Chris, like, because we thought, you know, okay, well, we have these five or six challenges with our businesses, with our business. It's worth a lot. Why don't we just sell it? And then those challenges will go away and they'll be replaced by money. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> which just, solves that everything, was, right? <laughs> like, which solves everything. Exactly. That was our level of sophistication. We were so wrong on so many levels. And not only were we wrong, but like this process, it took two years to sell our business, a full two years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like, you know, that's a meaningful percentage of your total career. Right. And then it, I think it took us two years to, to just sort of get over the fact that we sold it. So it was like a four year epoch, you uh -huh. know, it's like, so it was a major thing, man. It was a major, major thing. And let's make the distinction now between selling a business, which I've done a handful of times before and two times before, depending on how you count a business that it's one thing to like transact make a transaction, you know, like, Hey, here's something that's worth this. You think it's worth it. Let's sell it. Exiting is different. And I think exiting is a career change. It is selling your baby. It is selling that thing that you put your best energy and your blood, sweat and tears and your time into for years and years and years. And I think here's what people in our community can tend to do and encouraged by many business thinkers around us. We conflate our earnings with our career. So mm. take a look at like the four hour work week, for example, that book encourages you to think, oh, well, your job is a really inefficient way to make a, make money because it forces you to be in one location. It forces you to be there, you know, eight hours a day plus commute, all those sorts of things. And so the author then says you need to become more efficient and move across the fence, become an entrepreneur and then you can make the same amount of money or a little bit less, but live in a cheaper place. And, you know, you can do all this in a few hours a day instead of in 50 hours a week or whatever. The problem with that kind of thinking is, number one, that's not how you grow a successful business is automating stuff to four hours a week or whatever. Everybody knows that. It doesn't mean the book's a bad book. It just means that what you actually do is work harder for five years. Everybody that has met an entrepreneur, has been to one conference, knows that. OK, mm -hmm. anybody who says otherwise is full of shit. The other the other thing is, well, yeah, you might be able to then work four hours a week. It's very common. It can happen. The problem then is you've thrown out the baby with the bathwater because your career gave you so much more than a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And even if you hated a lot of those things, it gave you a sense of community, a sense of service. It gave you something to do. It gave you a community, a tribe. So many things our careers give us. So a lot of us 
look at our businesses, the thing that we identified with, the thing that we worked hard on for half a decade, a decade or more, and then just transact it. We just sell it. And we've sold a lot more than that asset. We've sold a sense of our identity, a part of who we were. And uh, that's really hard to replace. And so that's a lot of what people don't talk about. So you mentioned the sense of your identity, but also community and tribe. What are some other things that you miss from your business? Um, I miss having a platform for ideas. Um, our businesses give us a idea generation machine, a group of people on hand whose job it is to take your vision and turn them into cash flows. It's one of the things I miss. I miss having that ace up my sleeve when I go to the poker table of any conversation. Mm. Because here's the thing, Chris, like time and money are amazing. But there's a problem with time and money. Everybody has them. They're commodities to some degree. Now, so when you go to a business conversation, you're like, hey, I'm thinking about getting into an investment. I'm thinking about investing in some business. I'm thinking, like, that's everybody. That's everybody who's ever made a buck in entrepreneurship is thinking about investing in young <laughs> entrepreneurs or whatever. Now, if you come to the poker table with, oh, I, I have 15 people in California that create custom-built industrial furniture for me. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking. Because you meet somebody who ha is in a related business, who you know does something that's tangential, potentially interesting. Now, all of a sudden, it's not just a cool person or somebody with some ideas, but it's somebody with some assets. And if you connect those assets, you could create something exciting. And so I miss the power that that business brought me when I was networking with people. Because I love hanging out with people and meeting new friends and everything. And all that's great. But there's a whole other element to networking, which is creating synergies between assets that are much bigger than time, money, and you two talking, right? Yeah. So I miss that quite a bit and forgot how valuable that is and how difficult it is to replace. I miss having a team of professionals that are full-time working for me that take care of things like financials, design, day-to-day uh, -day management of the business. You know, If you have a a sophisticated business that you've built, that's a really powerful asset. You know, we've often described it as like an Iron Man suit, sort of, it extends your power. Um, it augments, um, augments your ability to do things in, in the ways in which a cash pile can't do. A cash pile can, get inv can invest in things, but it's quite difficult to find good investments. It's a lot easier for that pile to simply erode. Did you say the leverage in your business was more valuable to you guys than the payout from selling your business? Most certainly, yes. It was more valuable than three times net profit plus inventory and assets, which is the, I think it's pretty fair to say, like, at least in my sense, like, that's the average that a business will sell for is, um, Three times earnings. Right. So you're going to get, so we spent two years to sell a business to get three years of the net profits forwarded to us, which is no small thing because a lot of our net profits didn't go into our personal bank accounts. They went back into the business as investments, which, you know, before we sold the business, we thought, um, you know, this business dominates a lot of our cash flow. It's very cash intensive. Uh, that's pretty risky. We want to take some of that off the table. But you don't need to go sell the business to take risk off the table, right? And it's very difficult to find an investment that's that good now, which is a 20% return on your cash year over year. Um, you know, People don't just give out access to opportunities like that. You have to earn them. They're difficult to find. So, um, yeah, I think the business was worth more to us in retrospect than three times earnings plus um, – plus the assets. So looking back, would you have done the same thing or would you have kept the business? Would have kept the business. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like I, I could, the, the problem with that, Chris is like, I don't know how to answer it. You could answer it so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and people are pretty emotionally engaged in that answer. Um, you know, 
people will encourage me not to say that very often. People <laughs> don't want me to give that answer. <laughs> Why? Um, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of different reasons. Um, people will say, well, you couldn't have known now what you knew then, but that sort of negates the value of the question in the first place. Um, people don't like the idea of people having regrets, particularly about making a lot of money. Mm. Um, you know, people feel that it might not be possible for me to have these thoughts then, so I needed to go through the process in order to have them. I think it's actually more interesting just to call bullshit on all that. I honestly think that this conversation has been dominated by industry professionals who benefit from selling your business and by entrepreneurship porn that encourages people to achieve this, you know, Mount Rushmore or like Everestine of entrepreneurship, which is the exit. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that if you actually talk to people who've done it, half of them are miserable about it. Really? Yeah. And so part of the reason I want to write this book is like, hey, you know, the conversation is whack. You know, everybody knows a conversation. Everybody could probably imagine a truth that they know is true about life that isn't expressed properly in the media. You know, like the media's got it wrong for whatever reason. Their, their incentives are misaligned or the wrong people are talking about it or whatever. I think this is the case in this small business space. There's hardly an entrepreneur that I talked to for this book that didn't think they could have learned these lessons before they exited, hmm. had they been available. And there's only a couple blog posts out there and one book called Finish Big, which is to be, I think is a great book on the one hand, but on the other, I don't think it does a great job of sort of convincing entrepreneurs that the themes are important. And I think that's part of the reason, Chris, that people don't have this conversation is that people don't want to have it. They don't want to talk about how this thing that's supposed to be great is actually like really complicated and sophisticated and time consuming and it's a grind like everything else. It's supposed to be what we're all working for. And I think it can be a rude awakening or just a bummer yeah. to talk about. Like people are probably tuning out of this episode. I'm talking about this is this is the end game, people. Like everybody <laughs> exits. Everybody, everybody's exiting at some point, whether you want to or not, whether it's your call or not. And it's worth thinking about what your end game looks like. Hey, listeners, thanks again for joining the show. We wanted to remind you about our Get Shit Done one-on-one -on -one productivity coaching that we recently just launched. What we do is work with you to create big business goals that are absolutely game changers. We make a plan together and put you in our productivity hacking system that helps you stay on target. Each week, you get a call with yours truly about what steps to take for the following week. Some say it's like a year of productivity in just three months. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching. Thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching. And make sure you check out the second part of Dan's podcast interview that will be published tomorrow. Until then, ciao.